Okay, so let's get started. Today's discussion is going to be on titrations. There's going to be two lectures on titrations. This one is the stoichiometry lecture. So this is when you're doing a titration and you hit an endpoint and you calculate, well, we'll do some calculations related to it, but we're not doing equilibrium calculations today. But if you don't understand this part of a titration, you have no hope of doing the equilibrium part of a titration. So uh, the stoichiometry part of a titration is when you're really precise and you hit the endpoint and you stop. If you go past it, or if you stop short, then you're in an equilibrium situation. And you can add in the skills that we have for equilibrium to understand what's going on when you're not at the endpoint. But if you stop at the endpoint, then you can use this as a stoichiometry type calculation and it's really quite easy compared to the equilibrium portions. So let's step back and, and review what a titration is. Now, again, with the lab, I think the lab and the lecture are disjointed a little bit. They're managed, uh, but it's just different schedules and it's hard to keep it all exactly lined up. So raise your hand if you've done titrations in the lab already. You've done two already? Okay, so this will probably be review. Hopefully you won't be bored, but let's go through it anyway. Uh, and, I, and I realize it's, uh, it's definitely a source of irritation when the lab and the lecture are, are disjointed. But if you think about the number of points that are on uh, at stake, right? Having the lab first is not as bad as it sounds because the lab is really worth one fourth of your grade and then it's sort of prime the pump. Now you have a chance to really shore up those things that you don't understand about titration. And then the exam is gonna be worth a lot more points. The lab's a fourth, yeah. Oh, it might be a fifth. It's something fourth or fifth, yeah. It, it's 20%, okay, so it's a fifth, yeah. And so um, essentially the lab and these couple of lectures will help you do really well on this middle exam. So this is the process of titration. This, this little bit of volume here, I'll go through some of the vocabulary that's on the next page. This is called an aliquot. I remember when I first learned that word, I thought it, it was a new word for me. I thought it sounded weird, so I call it an alley cat. So that's how I remember the alley cat. So you have an alley cat of acid. Uh, no, it's an aliquot of acid. It's just a small volume. Um, how would you know? How many moles are going in here? Right? Well, you take the, the, if you know the concentration times the volume, that equals the number of moles. Okay. So you definitely know the volume that you put in. A lot of times you want to know the concentration. So how do we get the concentration of that initial amount? We do the titration. So the number of moles of base, like if this is a, an acid and we're doing this, this amount of moles of base, this right here, this volume times the concentration of this base will equal the number of moles of base. And then if we know the balanced chemical reaction, we can get to the number of moles of acid and if we know the volume, we have the moles, we divide by the volume, we get the concentration. So that's what we're doing in a titration. We have some unknown thing that's called the titrant, I mean, called the, um, the, you know, the unknown. In the burette, we have a titrant. And it is known. What do I mean by known and unknown? We're talking about concentrations or purity or something like that. So we know the concentration of the titrant. That's our tool. We use this really precise uh, volumetric piece of equipment called a burette. Uh, typically it's marked off in tenths of a mil and then you can estimate between the marks by a half. And so you can get 0.05 or 0 0.00. So a lot of your uh, volumes are going to be four significant figures. And so let's go through the voca vocabulary of, ti of titration. So this aliquot is a small amount of a substance you're titrating. So in this case, you could use that in a sentence like a five mil aliquot of an unknown acid was titrated. 
So we have the volume of that, but we don't know how many moles of acid are in that five mils. The titrant is the known solution that you're using to titrate an unknown substance. And to use that in a, in a sentence, you might say something like 32.15 milliliters of titrant was added to the flask. And in that titrant, you know what that is. It's, point, it's some molarity, some known molarity of a base or an acid. There are other kinds of titrations other than acid-base titrations. There are redox titrations. So if you might have a, a oxidation reduction reaction, and we'll cover those when we get to redox chemistry. So we'll come back to this a little bit and mention the redox titration later. <clears throat> but most of the titrations I think are done for acids and bases. <clears throat> then there's this, this word titer. That's the volume of the known solution that reaches endpoint. So as you're adding in the, the, the known solution, something indicates that the reaction is complete. Most of the time it's a color change. So when that color changes, you stop, you record that volume, that volume is known as the titer. Then the burette, that's that volumetric glassware that measures how much titrant was delivered. You've seen those in the lab. Yes? Yeah, so you reach the end point, you stop, that's the number you write down, that's the titer. <clears throat> now, there's a, a special spot <laughs> where the stoichiometry max matches exactly, that's the equivalence point. And we, we really don't know when that happens. We want the endpoint to be as close to the equivalence point as possible. But the endpoint is what we see. We don't see the equivalence point. That's when there's an exact match of acid and base. Okay. <clears throat> so the endpoint is the end is the point where the signal indicates that the stoichiometric match of acid and base has happened. The reason these are not equal is the equivalence point is when the acid and base match and then you add a little bit more base and it reacts with the indicator. So it reacts with the acid first and once that's all gone, then it reacts with the indicator and you get a color change. And so that you have to go past the equivalence point a little bit and then you get a reaction with the color change molecule. So these are two different points in the titration but if they're really close together, you can't tell the difference. Like we want them to be so close together that they're essentially equal. And so that's what I mean. We want that endpoint to happen fast and we want it to be close to the equivalence point as possible. And then the indicator, that is a substance that changes color with pH. So there may be some um, rearrangement in the molecule when you donate a proton or change, take a proton off, the molecule rearranges and now it changes color. And it can be a really small change. I did a research project on phenolphthalene and there's a, there's three rings on there and one has an acid group that comes back and bonds to this uh, carbon. It's a, a carbon with three bonds and that, that uh, carboxylic acid group comes back and bonds to that. But if I, tight, if I uh, protonate that carboxylic acid, then it rotates out of the way and that totally changes the color of the molecule. It makes it clear. Uh, if I take that proton off, then that bridge happens, and now it's purple colored. So just a single charge, a single proton will cause a structural change in that molecule, and now you have a totally different color for that molecule. And that's how the indicators work. And they're really complicated molecules in some cases, but you really don't have to know that. You just put a couple of drops in there, and when you run out of acid or run out of base, then your indicator reacts and you get a color change. Uh, we want this indicator, um, to change color during the steepest portion of the pH curve. So go ahead, if you've got your notes, and circle that piece right here. <clears throat> and so let me show you the pH curve of a titration. Oh, well, we'll get to that. <laughs> so let's look at a typical titration problem first, and then we'll look at the pH curve for this titration. So this is a typical problem 100 mils 
of a household vinegar solution. So right out of the, you know, out of the pantry, you can get household vinegar and put that in the bottom flask and titrate it to endpoint with strong base. So it's reacting with the acid. Once the base reacts with the acid, it'll, it'll react with the phenolphthalein indicator. Um, endpoint was reached at 43.35 mils of a 2.017 molar sodium hydroxide solution. So look at this problem. Now, what's the question? Well, the question is, what's the molarity of the vinegar? In terms of acetic acid, the active ingredient in, in vinegar is acetic acid. And so uh, the question is, what's the molarity of this solution? So what key things do you see in this problem? Yep, so we have the con we know the concentration of NaOH. Um, we have two milliliters amounts, right? So both reactants are given. We're given an amount of acid and we're given an amount of base. And whenever you see that in a problem, whenever you have both reactants, if there's two reactants and you have both of them, or even if there's three or five reactants, if you have two of those reactants, anytime you have multiple reactants, it's a limiting reactant problem. You're going to run out of one of those unless you get lucky and they both match, like they both run to zero and you have the same X. So in the little stoichiometry table, if you get the same X for both of them, you have a stoichiometric amount of, of that. But that's pretty rare. Normally you run out of one. So this is a limiting reactant problem. And by definition, all titrations are limiting reactant problems because you're taking one reactant and you're titrating with the other until you run out of it. And when you run out of it, then you calculate the other and see uh, the information about the unknown that you're, that you're looking for. Oh, phenolphthalein is in this problem. That's a good indicator for strong bases. We're going to spend a lot of time looking at indicators today and, and, and the different properties of indicators. And then endpoint. Okay, this means we have a straightforward stoichiometry problem, not an equilibrium problem. So we don't, we're not going to have to have an ice table or anything like that. We can just use our stoichiometry skills and solve for uh, the amount of acid. So this is just some key things to know about just the generic um, titration type problem. Notice also in the problem, we have lots of significant figures. So most of the time in this class, I was happy with just two numbers, right? If we're getting a molar mass of carbon, we just write down 12. It's really 12.01, but, you know, we're just doing back of the envelope calculations, sort of estimates, not so for titrations. Titration is an analytical chemistry uh, exercise. And so you're trying to get really precise numbers. You want to keep all the significant figures in a titration problem. So that's why there's four sig figs written for everything. Um, when we want the molarity of the acetic acid solution, this is, our, this is where we're headed. We're headed for moles of acetic acid per liter of solution. Okay. We do have the volume of the solution right here. Okay, so we have the volume of household vinegar right there. So that's, that's, that's this piece right here. What we need is the moles. And the amount of titrant is directly related to the number of moles of acid. So it's the acid we added in there that, that governed how much base we had to add until we got a color change. So let's start with that um, 43.35 mils of sodium hydroxide. Here's your balanced chemical reaction. We have the acetic acid reacting with sodium hydroxide to give water and sodium acetate. And so we start with a 43.35 mils of sodium hydroxide solution. Let's go ahead and get out of milliliters and get into liters so that we can use the molarity. Okay, what do you think is next? Yeah, so we'll use the molarity so we can get to moles of sodium hydroxide. We're trying to get closer and closer to the moles of acetic acid. So let's go to moles of sodium hydroxide. And notice all of the units are canceling. We got the mils canceling here, the liters 
Hence them here. Boom. And then we have moles of sodium hydroxide. And then we use this one to one ratio from the reaction. I've got one to one. So we can convert directly from moles of sodium hydroxide to moles of acetic acid. So we just build this train until it gives us the units that we want on top. So now, in terms of your calculator, a lot of people get really worried about order of operations, but, but multiplication and division are what we call commutative. It doesn't matter what order you do them in. And so you can prove this to yourself. You could take the 43.35, divide by 1,000, times 2.017, or you could take 43.35, times 2.017 divide by a thousand does not matter which order you do these in if you have any kind of additions in there and so on then you've got to pay much more close attention to the order of operations but if everything's multiplication and division it does not matter which one you do first second third and so on <clears throat> so you should end up with 0 0.08744 moles of acetic acid we know the moles that's the numerator we know the volume, which is the denominator. I just did one thing. I took 100 mils and I divided by 1,000. So that becomes 0 0.1, 0 0.1 liter. And so that's right there. Same number. So I have moles per liter of solution. So that's 0.8744 molar acetic acid solution. So that's a that's a straightforward titration problem. Okay. Notice all the all the sig figs I kept. <clears throat> and sometimes if like this one has on the calculator five or six, it's good to keep a that fifth digit just as a guard digit. So when you do this division, you don't lose or you know have a rounding error. And so that that. If everything has four significant figures, that fifth one we call a guard digit. And it's good to keep that in all your intermediate calculations so that you don't have a rounding error at the end. Now for grins and giggles, what's the percent volume volume of acetic acid in this solution? And so to do this, we're gonna to need to know the density of acetic acid, and so it's given in the problem. So how do we approach this? Remember a percent is a part over a whole. So part, over whole. So <clears throat> what is the whole in this case? What's the, and it's VV, so what's the volume of the whole solution that we want to know? The what? The, it's given in the problem. It's the 100 mils. That's the whole, okay? That's the amount of vinegar. So that's 100 mils. What we want to know is the volume of acetic acid. How am I going to get that, right? Yes, yeah, so I've got the moles of acetic acid right here. And density is grams per mil. So somehow I've got to get from moles to grams or to milliliters. Can I get from moles to grams with what? Periodic table and the molar mass. Okay, so come down here. I've got that moles. I find the molar mass. So I got to start adding up two carbons, two oxygens, four hydrogens, add all that up and notice how many digits. I don't just estimate it to be 60. This is an analytical chemistry problem. So I want to keep as many digits as possible. So I go ahead and find, you know, the, the molar mass using all of the, digits from the periodic table, and I get 60.052 grams of acetic acid per mole of acetic acid. And then now, since I have grams of acetic acid, I've got the density here, and that gets me out of grams and into volume. So I'm gonna use that one upside down. I'm gonna divide by that density. Now this density, it limits my precision, doesn't it? It's, the, it's a junky number because it only has three sick figs. So I might try to find a more accurate or more precise source for the density of acetic acid. But, you know, if I if I can't, then this is the best I can do. But we'll go ahead and use it as is. So now my, my moles are gone. 
my grams are gone, and I have volume of acetic acid, which is 5.001 mils of acetic acid. Really probably because of that's three, I probably should just round to three sig figs. So that's my part. The 100 mils is the whole. So I can divide that by the 100 mils and I get 5% vinegar. So. <clears throat> The reason I wanted to do that is because I wanted to make this a, a realistic problem. And so if you go to the grocery store, I want to make sure everybody's done writing. If you missed the last few numbers, you can get them on the video. So, you know, this is a realistic example. If you go to the grocery store and, and buy vinegar and turn the bottle around and look down there at the bottom, this is what you see. Distilled white vinegar diluted with water to 5% acidity. <laughs> so if you did a you know, 100 mils of vinegar and you had that particular uh, strong base, you know, two molar sodium hydroxide, uh, you would titrate and get 43 mils before you get the color change. So this is this is a good, good example of, you know, if you were doing quality control on the vinegar and they wanted to verify that it was 5%, this is the calculation you would do in the lab as a quality control person. That way you're not wasting money by sending out vinegar that's way too strong. <laughs> selling too much of the good stuff or or you're not jipping your uh customers by charging them for five percent but really only selling them three percent so this is a ph curve i had mentioned it earlier and this has got a bunch of different weak acids titrated with sodium hydroxide and enough acid was titrated so that the equivalence point would be at 20 mils of sodium hydroxide. So when it reaches 20 mils, you see this incredibly st st uh, steep jump in pH. So this is pH over here. This is a base, basic solution. And down here is acidic. So low pH is acidic, high pH is basic. We're putting in a strong base of sodium hydroxide. There's really no change or very little change to the pH until I run out of acid. And when I run out of acid, I add that one more drop of base and the pH shoots up because now I'm just adding base to water. The acid's gone. So you add a little bit of base to water, you get a whole lot of hydroxide ion and the pH goes way high. Um, and so here's different acids with different pKa values. So the different strengths of acid. So this red one is an acid with a pKa of 2. Uh, here's one with 4, 6, 8, 10. And so what do you see happening with these? So describe what you see with these various pKa values. They're converging. Converging how? That's Yeah, and so that's when you've run out of the acid and then it's all sodium hydroxide. So that's why they're converging because from this point here, I guess, let me draw it right here. From, from the equivalence point to the right, it's just sodium hydroxide and, and salt water. So salt from the acid and then sodium hydroxide, which adds a lot of hydroxide. So over here is when you have the acid area, weak. Okay, so that's good. What were you gonna say? Oh, I was just gonna say the same thing. Okay. Off, yeah, they caps off at that equivalence point. That's when you see a sharp change. And so that's when the titration's over. In this particular curve, they kept adding sodium hydroxide just to see what it would do to the pH. But at that point, with 20, 20 mils, that's that's the equivalence point right there. And we want that to be the end point. We want a color change to happen at that steep part of the of the pH curve. Okay. So what is the pH at half equivalence? So let's go back to half equivalence. So let's jump down here to 10. What's the pH of all of these acids? at half the equivalence point. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they, the pH equals the pKa at half the equivalence point. So here, this yellow one is a really good example. pH of 6, and that yellow one has a pKa of 6. Now, we've already seen that equation. It's just here we're seeing it in terms of, uh, of a graph. So what is that Henderson-Hasselbalch equation? The pH is equal to the pKa plus the log of the concentration of the base over the concentration of the acid. And that's the acid and its conjugate base. So when I'm titrating this, I'm turning the acid into its conjugate base. Now, why does this match exactly at the half equivalence point? So I started out with, say, you know, a lot of acid in here. When I'm halfway to equivalence, I've turned half of that acid into its conjugate base. And so these numbers are equal to each other. So at this point right here, C base equals C acid. And if those are equal, then this is the log of one. So the log of one is equal to zero. So this little correction factor that corrects the pH is zero at the half equivalence point and the pH equals the pKa. So that's one way to determine the pKa for an acid is to put a pH probe in there, titrate it very slowly with a strong base, and then when you've reached the equivalence point, come back halfway, and that's the pKa for the acid. Yeah? Okay, so let's, let's look at that. So let's say we had an acid like, um, uh, well, like acetic acid, right? And, and we might have a concentration of that. And then when we titrate that with sodium hydroxide, we get water. And then we get the sodium acetate. I'm going to go ahead and yeah, put that minus right there and then the sodium next to it. So this is the, is the base that we're talking about. So C base is, is this concentration of the acetate anion, and this is the acid right there. And so halfway to equivalence, I've turned half my acid into base. And so I have two halves, and they're equal to each other. Yeah. And so then that pH curve passes through the pKa and then goes over to the equivalence. Uh, we will get to it later, but notice how flat these curves are, right? This pH change, let's just talk like from this region here to this region here. I've added, you know, from like 1 to 19, you know, I've added 18 mils of strong base to this solution, and the pH has only changed by like maybe one unit. It went from, well, two units. It went from say five to seven. So I added a ton of base and the pH only changed a little bit. It only changed within two, two units of pH. That's what we mean by buffer. So this middle region is a buffer solution. I'm adding lots of base and the pH isn't changed. So the pKa is also the ideal spot for a buffer. So if I wanted to make a buffer that was buffered around a pH of six, then I would use an acid that had a pH of 6. And in that middle region, this is the buffering region. Between these two marks here. And so that real flat part of this pH curve is the buffered region. And, and the buffers are strongest when they're right near their pKa's. I can add a lot of base and it doesn't change the pH much. Your, all of your internal systems are buffered. Your stomach is buffered with really strong acid. Your blood is buffered with uh, you know, like carbonic acid. And, and, uh, and, and so, you know, your body is really resistant to changes in pH. 
Now, how do we measure these pH curves? Well, we can spend a thousand dollars on a real fancy probe that gets us three decimal places and is repeatable and accurate and so on. Or we can spend, you know, like a hundred bucks on a little dip probe, pin probe. And, and so going from two decimal places to three decimal places, the the cost goes up by a factor of 10. <laughs> so you go from a hundred to a thousand dollars to get that third decimal place, but you also get more repeatability, temperature correction, all kinds of things. So, but for most part for titrations, these little pin probes are good enough. You know, you can map it out and you can get that curve. And if you can model the whole curve, you can get an accurate representation of the PKA. Okay. Now, pH is really important also for personal safety. So let me just go through this. This is really not a part of this course. It's just sort of the broader perspective. So there are regulations on how we label things. And one of those is for hazard communication. And, and pH is a, an important factor for labeling waste and labeling, labeling bottles. And also for Department of Transportation, you know, trucks going down the road, if they've got a big uh, a van full of acid, then you need to have an appropriate label on the outside. So if it flips over and it's leaking, you don't go over there and stick your finger in it and taste it. You know, what's this? You know, they always do that on the crime shows. And I'm like, you're stupid. You don't do that. Especially now with fentanyl, you know, what's this? <laughs> Down they go. Um, so, so this is a guide for labeling for skin corrosion or irritation. And so this, if the mixture contains more than 1%, that's not very much, just 1% of an ingredient, that is corrosive. And what is corrosive? Well, acids and bases with extreme pH. Now notice it's not just low pH or high pH, it's extreme pH. So it could be low or high. So a corrosive substance is not just a base, it could also be an acid. It just, it's got a really high pH or really low pH. And so if it's above 11.5 or below two, then it's destructive to skin. And it can chew into your skin, create a, a it can kill the, the skin layers, you know, and, and so then you have a big open sore and so on. Uh, you need to, if you get anything on your skin, you need to wash it off right away. Don't let it sit and get to it later just because you don't feel anything, right? Uh, one of the most nightmare stories I ever heard was a fellow was working with uh, sodium hydroxide pellets, okay, and he, he made a spill on the desk and one fell into his boot, okay, and he and it's, it's down his boot, he felt it and and it kind of itched a little bit, but then it went away and he thought it was okay. End of shift, he takes his boot off and he's got a hole in the side of his ankle. It, when it went away, it had deadened the nerves. So it had damaged the skin and deadened the nerves. And so it was just dissolving away into his skin and creating all kinds of corrosion on his skin. And he didn't feel it because it had killed the nerve signal. That's worst case scenario, it's nasty. But, but my point is that it's really destructive to skin, extremely high, extremely low. Um, and so uh, wash it off. Now, if you get base on your skin, it, it does uh, react with the fats in your skin and will dry your skin out. So follow up with lots of lotion. But uh, that also means it feels soapy, okay? And so you gotta wash it. At one time I got sodium hydroxide on my hand and I had to wash my skin for like 30 minutes. I had to sit there under the sink and just, just rub it until it didn't feel soapy anymore. And, and eventually it didn't feel soapy and I was fine. Okay, but sitting there under tap water for 30 minutes is really boring. So, yeah. Uh, what's the soapy feeling? It's actually turning the fats in your skin to soap. So it's your own fats making the soap. <laughs> yeah. Um, it just will absorb into the skin. And so, yeah. Yeah, and so you just have to, like my hand has a dry patch here from handling solvents over the years and so on. And so I just have to lotion that up. Yeah, whenever I, because that collagen and everything, uh, just keep replacing it with, with lotion. And, and that's what I do. And it keeps it manageable. It doesn't crack. Your skin can dry enough to where it'll start to crack. Yeah, and it's awful and it's painful. Yes. So how come if you've got like a, a few drops of hydrochloric uh, HF on your hand, you had like amputated before, how come it keeps going? I don't know. But it's awful. Like we had the scariest poster. This is like morbid day, you know, but it, we had the scariest poster in the lab about hydrofluoric acid and it, it'll just keep going all the way to the bone. And I don't know why you can't wash it out. Do you know? 
Yeah, so a lot of the soapy stuff, uh, soaps, essentially the first soaps were just animal fat reacted with, with sodium hydroxide, with lye. And it will take uh, the molecule, wherever there's a double bond or whatever, break it open and put a carboxylic acid group on it. And so when you have that carboxylic acid group, then that's a polar head, and then you got the fatty tail, and that's the soap. And so then the fatty tail will get into the grease and oils, the polar head will be soluble in water. You get enough of these, it'll make a micelle or, um, you know, a micelle that contains the grease blobs. And then that allows the grease blobs to go up into solution. Uh, the fats will precipitate with calcium and our water typically has a lot of calcium in it. And that's what creates soap scum and scale. So they tried to find soaps that didn't have carboxylic acid groups. So they started using sulfates and phosphates because they didn't precipitate with calcium. And those are detergents. And so when you hear the word detergent, it's a non-carboxylic acid soap. And when you hear soap, if they're being technical, that's a carboxylic acid soap. So uh, just replacing that carboxylic acid, which is acetic acid, you've seen that, that's the COOH. That's the carboxylic acid group. If you replace that with an SO4, then you can take a sulfate and stick it on an organic molecule. That's a detergent. PO, PO4, phosphate, phosphate, you could bond that to an organic molecule and make a phosphate detergent. They're trying to get rid of those because the phosphate breaks off and goes into the environment and it's not a pollutant, okay? It's, it's a fertilizer, <laughs> okay? So it causes algae to grow and grow and grow and get out of hand. And so the whole thing with phosphates, free soaps, is they're just trying to get away from filling our lakes and streams with, with uh, overabundance of algae. Mm -hmm. And my lead medic at the time was like, it doesn't matter what we do with it, he's going to lose that man. Yeah, it's so crazy. Like, why? Like, how does it work? I do not know. If you ever find out, send me an email with the, like, why. Like, I don't know the mechanism. I just know the progression. Yeah, it's terrible. So if you have a, like, if you have a waste bottle or if you have a, a solution, you want to quickly test the pH, you don't have to have a pH probe. We, they make these little tapes. So you pull this little paper off, tear it off, stick it on a watch glass. Don't stick the paper, especially if you're looking at your analytical solutions, you want them to be pure. Don't stick anything in there because you're going to contaminate it. Take a clean, clean glass stirring rod, dip it in the solution. There'll be a little drop on the end, put it on the paper and then let the color change. Then you read it against the little thing. Have y'all seen this in the lab? Have y'all used these? But yeah, but litmus in particular is just red or pink uh, or pink or blue. Yeah. And this has a lot of little indicators in the paper, which will change all these different colors. You can get most of these colors from purple cabbage. And so if you ever want to do this at home with vinegar and ammonia solution and so on, like if you're, you know, in the future, you're having to do a demo for, you know, your, let's say you're a teacher and you're doing this for class. You don't have to go buy all these expensive indicators and everything like that. Uh, just get red cabbage you know, chop up a little bit, put it in a juice glass with some water, stick it in the microwave, microwave it, that water turns deep, deep purple. And that's your acid base indicator. Take a couple of drops and put that in, in, uh, in your vinegar solution and it'll change to like a light pink, I think. And then you come along with uh, household ammonia and you can start dropping drops in there and you're titrating a drop at a time and you'll see a color change when you run out of the acid. And so that's really, I mean, it's really fun. I like doing that. Uh, here are some other indicators. We talked about phenolphthalein. There's thousands, but here's phenolphthalein. This is probably the one you used in lab because you're titrating with a strong base. And notice this little region right here. So phenolphthalein is changing its color in this region right here. So it's clear as long as the pH is below 8. And then when it goes from eight up to 10 or so, I should probably go right here. So in this region, it changes color and then it's pink above. So do you see how the color bands are? This is, in all of these pHs, it's pink. and all of these pHs, it's clear. Um, notice there's an indicator change for just about every region of the pH curve. Okay. So let's talk about this titration curve. How do we pick an indicator? We want it to change color at the steepest part of the curve. So this is the steepest part of the curve. And notice how both of these shoot up 
to high pH. And so phenolphthalein is great for, for strong base indicators, right? So any of these, any of these indicators will work. Here's litmus. So there's the, you could find a litmus, um, um, uh, you know, indicator and actually put it in the solution or the methyl orange. And so as long as you're titrating a strong acid like HCl with a strong base, you know, you're titrating the acid, you finally run out, it shoots up through all three of these indicators. And each one of these would be a color change that's close enough to the equivalence point that it would be a, it would be a go. Okay, but only phenolphthalein is suitable for the weak acid titration. Here's the titration of a weak acid, acetic acid. That's this purple curve right here. And notice it doesn't get steep until high pH. So the other two wouldn't work for this. In fact, let's look at this. We want a very sharp endpoint. And the reason why is because we want it to be really close to that equivalence point, And we want just one drop of base to cause that huge jump. So that's what we mean by sharp. And, you know, once you run out of acid, the next, maybe even half a drop will cause the pH to shoot up and you get a color change. Now, in the acetic acid curve, how long in, in mils of sodium hydroxide will the litmus color change take? So it's gonna start changing color here and it's gonna be finished changing color here. And so look at that. It starts changing color. When you're dripping the burette around nine, you start to see a color change. And, and then it finally finishes changing at 25. That's ridiculous. That would not be a good indicator for acetic acid. So I don't really like the way they show this band though. Down here, this litmus, this litmus down here would be pink and up here would be blue. And in between would be some combination of pink and blue. So it just would be very ambiguous. Where's the endpoint? If it starts turning blue right here, and now the pink is fading, 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 and finally it's all blue, where's the endpoint? You don't know. So we want that endpoint to be on a really steep part of the pH curve. What about the, the um, methyl orange? It would start turning, turning colors here and end turning colors there. And so I would say, okay, it's done. My endpoint is at five mils, but that's nowhere near the equivalence point. You see how that would not even give an accurate result. I would say my titration is done here and I still have all of this acid left to titrate. It would be totally a wrong result. So choosing the indicator is important. You gotta kind of know what the pKa of your acid is before you can choose the indicator. So the pKa for acetic acid is around here at 4.75. And so I want my indicator to change colors at least a, a couple of pH units above that. And so I would want to have an indicator that change color at seven or higher. And then that would be a good indicator. So here phenolphthalein has a pA, pKa of 9.3. That means the color starts to happen around 8.3 and is fully developed by 10.3. And so phenolphthalein would be good for all of these, all of these acids. Uh, here's a level two titration problem. Let's go through this one real quick. Because here we're, we're, we're titrating um, sulfuric acid and this one's a polyprotic acid. So you've definitely got to look at that balanced chemical equation. The first part of this problem is the same. We start with the base, 40.15 mils of sodium hydroxide. I'm gonna do this one a little different. I'm gonna use that millimolar thing, which I know some people hate, but we're gonna say that there's 0 0.1013 millimoles per milliliter of solution. So these are both milli. And they out. Yeah, and they cancel out. So it's still molarity. Yeah, yeah. And so then uh, I get then the two to one ratio of sulfuric acid uh, and sodium hydroxide. So how many millimoles of sodium hydroxide do I have? Or so, sulfuric acid, I have 2.0336 millimoles of sulfuric acid. Now, the reason I like that is because I've got milliliters in my problem, 60.30. 
And so I can just, again, the milli here and the milli there cancel each other out. And then I have moles per liter, which is molarity. And so I can save time by not doing all the divide by a thousand and divide by a thousand and so on. And so I end up with 0 0.03373 molar sodium uh, sulfuric acid solution. So I call this a level two problem because it's a polyprotic acid. Okay. And so you got to take into account the two to one mole ratio. Otherwise, you're going to be you're going to be wrong. I'm going to go fast because we're running out of time. You've got the video, so you can go back and look at those numbers. Let's do one that's related to forensics. A lot of you folks are forensic chemistry majors. So here's uh, cocaine. And, uh, it, and so how do we titrate this base? Yeah, the pKa of cocaine is 8.6. And so phenolphthalein won't work as an indicator, okay? Because the pH change is gonna, the, the, the color change for the phenolphthalein is gonna be changing around the time where the, the cocaine is buffered, so. How can we use like sodium bicarbonate to reverse the effects? I don't know. I have to talk about that. You know, yeah. So, so how would you titrate a sample of cocaine since it's a base? Let's use an acid, right? So let's titrate it with uh, with acid. So we go the other way. We start with a you know a, a really a basic solution, and then we titrate with an acid, and then it falls. And so we want to find an indicator that changes two pH units away from the pKa. So the pKa of cocaine is 8.6. So that's 8.6 right there. So we want to use any one of those indicators. See, we went down two units, 7.6, 6.6. And so this is where the color changes for all of these acid-base indicators. And so we would start with our cocaine sample. Let's use bromphenol blue, okay? And our solution would be navy blue. And so we titrate with hydrochloric acid. And when we run out of base, it shoots down and we get a yellow solution. And that's easy to see. We can see it go from blue to yellow when we run out of our cocaine sample. And so here's our calculation. We've got one minute to go through. I'll talk you through it. You can do the numbers on the video. Is that cool? All right, look at this. We have a 24 mils of a known concentration of acid, but we're titrating two, a two gram sample of cocaine and it's impure, okay? We use the bromphenol blue indicator. How pure by mass is the cocaine sample? Sounds really complicated. It's not that bad. We need the moles, convert to grams, and then we take part over whole. I don't wanna write out the structure of cocaine, so I'm gonna use B for base, which is cocaine, yeah. Reacts with acid, I have protonated cocaine, okay. So here's the, no, you got the structure on the previous page, it's just too long to write. Yeah, so here's the mills of base, the molarity, I mean acid, That that's a typo, Woo, caught it, HCl. Mills of HCl to moles of HCl. One to one ratio, nothing tough there. And then I went ahead and went to mass of base. So now I've got the grams of cocaine. My titration tells me how much is actually cocaine. I divide that by the mass of the sample and I get the percent purity. So it was 45% pure cocaine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or it's just, you know, spreading your supply, yeah. Okay, so that's an example, a little forensic example for you. Now that's way too long for one little sample. They use chromatography to do quantitation on these drugs, but you could do it this way if you didn't have a chromatograph. So, all right, we'll talk to you later then. And uh, bring me the roster, whoever has it. Right. So we're given the, the pH. Yeah. After doing the experiment, so that's the given, right? We're using hydrochloric acid. There's the molarity. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Sorry. All right. So they do. So I got. Let's do this in the hall because I'm not going to oh, be able okay. to follow you and pack up. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. Yeah. No, it's. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.